Well, that's, um, that's great that you could join us today. And yeah. um, good to see everybody else. I think what I'm going to do is um, just let everybody know if you have any comments or questions or thoughts, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, uh, chat into the chat. James is always managing the chat for us. And I'm excited to share a little glimpse of the gate app. I'm ex excited to share about the pediatric gate virtual reality app. Um, and also to give you a glimpse of something that's really exciting that's coming up pretty soon. Um, we're busy collecting data and thinking about how can we teach movement um, like gate? How can we teach movement in the entry level and make it meaningful and simple enough that students can actually translate it into practice? Um, so yes, why don't I go ahead and share screen and um, go ahead and get started. It is 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Friday. All right. So um, let me give a, a brief history as more people are joining about this gate app. So maybe about five or six years, five years ago, we had just finished completing all of the clinical pattern recognition orthopedic apps. And each one of those apps took almost a year to build. And then we started getting faster because we started with low back pain. I mean, how hard is it to think about connecting prevalence, movement, examination, treatment, therapeutic exercises, all of that linked into an app. So it took forever to build these original orthopedic apps. Um, and selfishly, I was doing it for my classroom. I felt that students were having a hard time connecting all the dots. I, I, I felt like they needed to have a visual map of how all these things are connected. Um, instead of waiting to get pieces throughout the curriculum. So that's really how I use that app. Uh, shortly after, um, I had an alumni, he is now a professor with us, way smarter than I am, really detail oriented, and he was, he was teaching GATE. And James, uh, who's on the call with us, was my professor who taught me GATE. And so um, I talked with James, I talked with Chris, and I said, guys, there's gotta be a better way than stick figures and bar graphs and pictures that are not connected to the bar graphs, there's got to be a better way to teach students about human movement. And so today I'm going to share a little bit about how those apps, um, how, how, how those apps work, how we use them in the classroom. So the first question that I was chatting with James and Chris about was how can I train students to analyze movements, right? And something as complex as gait and eventually all sorts of common human movements. How do we connect movement analysis and eventually connect that to examination and treatment? Because gait is oftentimes an early, early in the curriculum class. And how can I enhance application of movement analysis across the lifespan? So I'll also give you a glimpse of the pediatric gait virtual reality uh, that we built in partnership with University of Idaho and Dr. Edie Kendall. Um, so let me take you, actually, let me take you into the app. The beauty of these sneak peeks is I don't have to rush. I can just talk about each of these little apps in its entirety. So let me go to here and go to PhysioU. So remember that most of you should already have access to this. When you log in here under the sign-in, it should take you to our new we recently reorganized all of our apps to make it easier for faculty and for students. There are so many apps now that you can find them by categories. So you can go, oh, I need to see all the neuro apps. Or I need to see all the fundamental skills apps. Here's assistive devices, gait, pharmacology, physical agents. Here's all of our new e-learning, our simulations and micro learning games that students are loving because they have a place to play with their knowledge. So let me take you into the gate app. We decided that when it comes to learning complex human movement, you always start at the learn phase. The learn phase is everything in static images. So you can see that here, all the phases are broken down. And we use, of course, instead of stick figures, real human images. So here is the phase. I'm going to shrink that down a little bit. And then here is the definition of the phase. So you can look at the phase, you can switch directly to the range of motion requirements for each phase. 
you can see hip flexion, 20 degrees, knee flexion, five degrees, ankle neutral. And the students always have a reference image. I think this is really an important part of their ability to understand these graphs and really begin to train their eyes to connect. What does a human look like? And how does that translate into my predictions of the movement faults or, or the movements that are required for gait? So you could switch to EMG. So here is the EMG graphs. These are all benchmarked to the Rancho Los Amigos gait uh, textbook as well as the Perry textbook. So all the language, we've tried our best to match the language, all the numbers match. Uh, and all of these graphs are then meant to tell a story. So here you can see that the tib anterior is working really hard to not let the foot slap. And then here is the critical events. So I'll put that right here. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see. So heel strike or heel first contact, deceleration, and initiate heel rocker. James, do you want to mention anything? You know, you, you and I had talked a lot about trying to reconcile the different languages. Yeah, early on, and, and, and I, God, I bore the heck out of you guys because I say this every time we talk about gate on any of these webinars, but this is the thing that hooked me about seven years ago when Mike's putting it together because I taught gate at, at Loma Linda where I was teaching for, for 26 years. And it was frustrating to not have a very good mega, I mean, going to YouTube trying to find a video or me trying to mimic a, a stroke gate pattern, you know, on the stage is, is, was kind of ridiculous. And so, um, yeah, so to have this, and we had to reconcile like it was Rancho. Uh, the Gillette folks up in Minnesota and other gate things. So we we really worked hard to reconcile the variations in language and um, how the the sets were set up here. So we're really looking. Uh, we just continually improve this, and 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 so I just was was just fell in love with Physio U and became part of the team thereafter from this. And so, but and I think Mike, you'll probably get to what the the, the prosthetics and orthotics component of this. That's right. Um, it's just you know it, it's I, I used to say that when people looked at pictures for gate it's like looking at a movie poster and, and a guy has to rate the movie you know a movie critic no and even the trailer is is a little bit better watch the whole movie watch the whole app here guys you'll see the value and the power in it as you go through so i i, I think this is very telling this is a very kind of landmark app for uh to show what, what fissure you can do for you yeah thank you james so so you can see that our students actually they play through learn on their own. They are studying. They, are, they have been given the task, please memorize the definition of each phase. Please look at the range of motion that you are seeing on the patient and reconcile that with the graph so you know what's occurring at each phase. Please look at the EMG activity. We're gonna talk about this in class. And then please make sure you understand the critical events because it's such an important part of your clinical reasoning eventually as you think about what are the issues that the patient is facing why is that phase of gait why does that look funny so the students then come to class prepped for deep discussion the instructor chris will actually go through this again but their, their brains are much more primed to understand what's going on. So you can take the learning so much further. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Then we move from the learn phase into analyze phase. In analyze phase, we have videos in real time. You have videos of close up slow motion. And by the way, all of these videos, you can actually copy this video right into your PowerPoint, copy the link. And when you copy the title with a link, essentially you will get, you can click on the link and it will open up because you all have PhysioU access, it will open up this video. Now you can't download the video into your PowerPoint, but all of these videos can be linked into your PowerPoints or your labs. So just so you know that there is this feature here on the sidebar that allows you to add these types of videos into your handouts, into your PowerPoints. So here is normal, sorry, let me go back to normal. You have the different views, which I think is quite unique. So let me make this a little bit bigger. Here's posterior view, slow motion. 
Here is the front view in regular speed. So we think it's always kind of value, valuable to see what real speed looks like, real time speed, and then also to be able to look at slightly more close up and in slow motion. Then you can go into range motion. So here, we have carefully matched. I mean, we took this EMG off of her. And now you can stop the video at any time and talk about, hey, at this phase, what phase of gait is this? What is the hip range of motion? What is the knee range of motion? And you can have all of these interesting, engaging conversations with the students. Notice how we, we have graded the exposure of movement in different phases, static learning, slow motion analysis, and now all of these conversations to bring those range of motion graphs and EMG graphs to life. So here's tip anterior, it's on during swing, it is now quiet during stance. And so you can talk about, you can stop it at any moment in the video, talk about the different muscles that are firing to keep the body from collapsing. And now you have a nice picture from static images to movement to help the students analyze gait. Now, the benefit of learning normal gait is to be able to compare it to all the deviations. So we went, all of us were tired of looking for videos on YouTube. Many times the videos that we use one year would not be there the next year. Now all of this is available available to you and the students all the time. So if you look at, we basically went after and found patients who had, patients and subjects who had these types of movement faults. So here is someone with trunk lean. And in the note below, there is information about the phase, associated phase for the deviation the potential causes, which I think is so valuable. They shouldn't just be able to identify what the fault is, the movement fault, but they should be able to say, I suspect that these few things may be an issue. Therefore, I should assess the range of motion for hip and knee. Therefore, I should assess dorsiflexion. I mean, think about what that does for make, adding value to the things that they're learning concurrently in your range of motion MMT class. Mark, I got a question to ask you. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, Kate asked that, uh, you know, and it's going to be a natural progression to this is that is there a teacher or instructor only portion of the app for, you know, gate questions and maybe testing and gate analysis? Have we have, have we gotten to that yet? Or are we still oh. just doing the formative and summative part and not the evaluation? Or is that, hey, sorry, that's the role of the instructor. You can't just, um, um, oh, Laura, I'm sorry. I wrote Kate. I'm sorry, Laura Sage. Um, yeah. um, Laura, yeah. actually, Laura, do you mind unmuting yourself and just clarifying what does that look like to you? Good morning. First off, thank you folks for uh, refreshing my memory on this. And I'm doing gate in two or three weeks. So this Perfect. is awesome timing. Thank you. You got it. We used the uh, abnormal gates as part of our uh, gate analysis uh, competency. Uh, and uh, I really like the idea of showing the students a uh, video, having them to see it over and over again, and for them to describe what deviation did they see in what phase, and they could see uh, anterior lateral views. Uh, and on one hand, if the student had seen it before, well, that's good. They were studying, they were preparing. Uh, but I also thought, well, is, is it fair, is, is it at all possible that there could be this cache off to the side of, of videos that maybe they hadn't seen uh, before? Yeah, great, great idea. Um, it's on my list, as you can see. Yeah, it's on my list, it. it's a long list. That's short list, right? Oh yeah, yeah that short list. If you, <laughs> if you see what we've been releasing for all of these different types of cache on the side, micro learning, where the students can now look at videos and go through little quiz questions about what phase of gait is the deviation in, what deviation is that, what is a potential impairment that might be driving that. That is 
absolutely buildable and easy for us to build. In fact, mm -hmm. it will be a part of uh, it will be part of the stuff that I'm building right now. You can see that we're building all of this type of micro learning. So watch out for it probably in early 2022 because my team is currently screaming for me to stop having ideas. But Laura, I love the idea. It's prime for that. And in mm -hmm. fact, what we might do is bring in a few. We have a lot of new patients that we will bring into the studio and we can create that separate little cache. I think that's a great idea. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yep, absolutely. So um, let me move on to, for example, you can see um, we can look at a varus thrust. So here is one of my colleagues. Actually, she wasn't a colleague, but she worked in our department. And she uh, always had knees that were really stiff and really irritable. So when you look at her from the front, you no longer have to try to describe a varus thrust. You can see that she has enlargement of her medial joint space. You can see that there is a varus thrust that is probably accelerating the stiffness and degenerative processes in her knee. And so we get to talk a little bit about the causes, talk about some of the penalty. That's kind of why we built the app, because now you could spend more of your time teaching and engaging the students in thinking than trying to look for resources and organizing resources. It's all here. A year or two later, we essentially went and filmed all the common prosthetic gait deviations. So you have transfemoral and transtibial. Let's take a look at knee instability. This is actually a, a prosthetics professor. And every gait deviation that we wanted, he would just pull his leg off, adjust it, and then start performing his faulty gait. In this case, he removed the battery out of his prosthetic. And here you can see the instability. We don't think the students have to learn what to do to fix this, but they should be able to identify that something doesn't look right, look at the associated phase, and begin to suspect a cause. So we worked closely with the prosthetist as well as the physical therapist um, to pull this together. So you now have all the common prosthetic gait deviations. You can go into it as much as you like or as little as you like. Another example of this, another one that I like, really like is um, here. So here's pistoning. How would you describe that? Well, we can just show the students and then talk about the phase, talk about the cause, talk about the penalty, and then allow the students to work through it on their own time. I think the other thing to think about when it comes to these apps is remember that this resource isn't just a fleeting YouTube video that's plugged into your PowerPoint. This is something that they pull out and study on their own all the time. The more ease they have access to this content, the better they can immerse themselves and expand the window of learning. The window of learning should not be in that moment that is only happening in class. Think about how much we use this before class, during class, and encourage them to play through it after class. So that's the, that's the deviations. And I also want to show you that we felt that it was really important to take it one step further, and that was to create a number of case studies. Now, technically, the case studies are of the same people that we've captured uh, deviations in. So this is, for example, a patient cross-country runner who's complaining of medial tibial stress syndrome. So the case is very simply written knowing full well that the students who are usually in this class are not familiar with the typical orthopedic evaluation. So we basically laid out some of the basic information that a student should begin to learn to gather, right? So here is the chief complaint. Here is the past medical history. Here are some aggravating factors. So we spelled it out as clearly as possible so that you could take them a half step further. I, I really believe in this idea 
that any content that you deliver, you should take them a half step further. It's like the handoff between batons between people in a relay. They are about to come into ortho after this class, but I want them to have seen and heard a little bit about aggravating factors and easing factors. And then the, here are all the key questions that we ask the students to go into their little Zoom breakout rooms or in little pods to discuss. What do you note about her overall gait pattern? So they watch the video, watch that together for a second. So we notice, so I'm gonna go back down here. What do you notice about her overall gait pattern? Oh, there's insufficient pronation, decreased calcaneal valgus. This is all primed for discussion. This is my half step, my hope that you will take them a half step further. What deviations do you note at the hip joint, at the knee joint, at the ankle joint? So all of these down arrows are available for now so that faculty can easily run a case while the students are discussing they're looking through all the answers in preparation for discussion eventually i'm going to hide these answers from the students only when faculty log in will these down arrows be available for faculty to open so it will be essentially the key that will allow you to quickly discuss without too much preparation I think, so, as a, I think as a teacher, you might, you know, cue the students, say, go to this area, look at those questions and kind of scratch down or get your ID here. And then we'll do a synchronous, you know, meeting, virtual meeting or whenever, and then we can go over and see what you guys came up with. And the thing I like about gate is it, it, it teaches them to think, but if they're wrong, it hurts nobody right now. I mean, if they do a wrong joint mob on somebody, there could be consequences with this. It's like, oh, I think they had, you know, pass for track. Well, it really wasn't. It's just that their hips not forward or, you know, there's there's very little negative side effects. So I think it's a good starting point. I like it in the beginning to beginning middle of a curriculum because it, it teaches them to think, not just memorize information. Right. And so we have a smattering of cases, prosthetic deviate cases, patients complaining of pain because of their prosthesis, patients with neurologic dysfunction, patients with orthopedic dysfunction, all of this is part of trying to take gait and turn it into a useful tool across, across the spectrum of different uh, specialty areas. So again, the basic case, it's all here. A real quick comment to uh, Kate's put on there about the, uh, the students and hiding in blinding them from the answers. Yeah. And right now, I think Mike, you said, you tell students, Hey, just don't go there yet. Don't, for your, don't for look your, at the answers for your learning. We're discuss it. Yeah. For your learning purpose, you know, it's like looking at the answer key of the crossword puzzle, you know, first try to get the crossword puzzle done and then go look at the key. Right. Right. So a lot of the students, right. They don't know anything about this yet, but think about that half step that you take them when you talk about this related to that patient. I think it's so powerful to be able to do that. So um, before I move on to the virtual reality gate app, uh, are there any comments or questions? Before people, because we'll get going here, Mike, and we're around time, people start going off. Please look at the chat. I put on there Mike's uh, contact information on the chat room at 9.16 a.m. if you want to look at that about um, how to contact Mike and actually schedule or kind of set up a, a call with him yep. is a uh, calendar. You may want to say something real quick, Mike, before it gets to the end. Yeah, right? no, I was just going to gonna say, um, anytime you have questions about how can I use any of the other apps tied to the curriculum that I teach, I'm happy to jump on a call. This is actually one of my, th the things that I enjoy most is connecting with faculty and hearing what you're doing and helping you understand how to fit the app in. So feel free to click on that link or just send me an email. James, if you could type it in, mike at physiou.com. Uh, I can, we can arrange, I'm usually free every morning of the week. I teach from one to six in the afternoons. So um, I'm, I'm happy to join in and chat with you or your, you or, and your colleagues anytime. Yeah. So Laura, before you teach your class in a couple of three weeks, you know, go over your stuff and then say, hey, I wonder if I'm using the app to its fullest you know, potential. And you may want to you know, meet with Mike real quick about that. Yeah. So let me move forward here and let you see Pediatric Gate VR. So what I like about this app is it takes some of the things, this is a partnership between University of Idaho and PhysioU. 
when I first saw this, I thought, what a cool way to help students take what is sometimes a very overwhelming information overload experience of analyzing GATE and give them a safe, easy, augmented reality, so to speak, virtual, re well, it's more virtual reality, way of applying, uh, applying this uh, new skill that they developed. So we use this in our GATE class. We also use this in our pediatrics class. So I'm going to put in my name here, if I can. Let's go. Hang on one second. Let's see. Let's give me one second here. Go like that. Start again. Okay, so put my thing here. Oh, let me select patient. Okay, my keyboard wasn't connecting there. So here, what you see. Let me scroll down a little bit. There we go. Is different patients that I can scroll around to look at their gate from different views. So I'm using my arrow keys here. I can zoom out, I can zoom in. And what we've done is we've created this, um, this is the Edinburgh visual gate analysis. It's a standardized, uh, standardized sequence of analysis that the students can now go step by step and do their, do their analysis. So we'll look at the involved limb. Initial contact and stance is toe first. And I'll go to the next. Heel lift in stance. It is no heel contact. I can change the level of view. I can pause the patient. It says maximum ankle dorsiflexion in stance. I can apply the goni and have the students try to measure that. Let's up a little bit first. Okay, so you can basically have them try to assess that. We may actually have to adjust that a little bit. And then you can apply a posture grid if you would like. So you can apply a posture grid and you can get them to move. So let me take that off, take the goni off. And I can actually move them forward slower or move them backwards slower. This allows the student really to take what is somewhat a, of a complex event and really just make it, you know, use some of these virtual tools to allow them to do their analysis. When they don't, if they don't understand what this score is asking them to do, they can always, let me make that bigger, they can always look at this uh, virtual gate kind of analysis score here, or sorry, this definition of what they are expected, let me make that bigger, sorry, what they're expected to be looking for. They can also look at patient history. Sarah is an eight-year-old girl with a diagnosis of right spastic hemiplegic cerebral palsy. So you will see that there's a number of patients in here that have different types of gait patterns, characteristic of common, common um, problems with pediatric patients. Right, so here's Austin, it's smaller, and we can just take a look at how Austin is going. So again, the way that we are using this is as a tool in the classroom where the students get on their own computers, work their way through the visual gate analysis score. When they are done, they are able to compare their score to the key that Edie put together during her analysis using the same tool. What I really like about this, so let me zoom out a little bit. What I really like about this is that it allows the students to go through a systematic process of analyzing gait in various patients that um, 
that help them actually begin to recognize these gait patterns and how they're associated with these, these different diagnoses. So this is uh, the Pediatric Gait VR app. Any comments or questions related to this? So here's just another few samples. So we use this, you could technically use this, you could assign it as homework. You could say, guys, this week for class, I want you to do the uh, Edinburgh visual gate analysis on Sarah, on Austin, on Jennifer, or as part of your class, you can actually have them each go to their computers. You say, guys, we're gonna look at Sarah, Everybody do your analysis. At the end, we're gonna talk about what you saw, what impairments you think you're going to measure, what impairments you think you're going to manage. All of these conversations can be built on top of the technology. So I think a lot of this, a lot of this is never in replacement of the clinical specialist who's the instructor. It basically makes, makes it so much easier for the instructor to build clinical reasoning and application on these different technology advantages, these different tools. Thoughts, comments, or questions? James? Is there anything? Uh, there going on? Yeah. Not, nothing in the chat. Okay. Um, Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, any, any comments or questions oh, about this? There's something now. Questions. Uh, yeah, Kate says that, yeah, just, you know, in my, in my comment in general is just that, um, and you wrote it earlier, Kate, and I think we're early in the chat about how there's just so much to learn and see, you know, um, for sure to elaborate. Um, I do not know in detail all that's on the apps. Yeah, I hate to say, you just got to hang out on this thing. You just got to, it's like whenever I adopt a new textbook, I almost got to read it cover to cover to see what's changed and added and changed. So, you know, using this tool now and to, uh, and I think the shortcut might be to contact Mike and say, hey, you know, what are the, what are the salient points here I need to do, you know, to, right. to, to get to be efficient and know all that the app can do for me. There's so many things. And, and then what you learn with one, and then if you have other colleagues in your program using it, you guys can say, Hey, yeah, in the manual muscle test, one, did you know this? And if they, in the uh, range of motion, one, do you know, it does this. And you can see if that's happening in the gate app too, and ortho neuro, whatever. So I think it's a pretty cool thing that yeah, if the whole faculty are using it, it's kind of cool. You guys swap stories and it'd be honest with you, the other one, your students will tell you, hey, did you know your app does this? You know, right. Dr. Jones or something. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Any other comments? And then I'm going to show you a little sneak peek of something we're working on that I'm super excited about. OK, so originally we built the gate app because I really wanted to think about how do we teach human movement and how do we use technology to do that better? But really, it was just a, a springboard for how we were going to teach other common movements. Mike, before you go off yeah. on this, uh, Wendy asked a great question. Sure. Can the students save the information they select and can print their answers to turn in? And you may, may, may want to make a comment about the scores and things like that. Yeah. It's, it, maybe not in this app, but other apps. For this app, it's a great question. I think eventually we could do it. We haven't built that functionality in yet. For a lot of the micro learning that uh, that are part of the other apps, those can all be, they, they have a tracking mechanism. Um, what I mean by that is, for example, and that's, that's a good moment, actually, just let me show that real quick. So in micro learning, for example, if I go to range of motion MMT micro learning, and I choose a game that I have played before, so, or a game that I was assigned, you can see that my track record here is available. So all the times that I've tried it, how much time I've spent on it, all of that's there and they can download the learning report. The learning report essentially gives you the date, the time, the person, the simulation or the game and the basic, uh, the basic scores. This actually I can adjust, but you basically, we have the students turn this in essentially. James, if you can make a note that I want to. Yeah. Just okay. Yeah. And so what is it within that micro learning? There's, there's questions that they go through. Here's a scenario. Here's a picture. 
now from that what's the first thing you need to do what's the second thing and so there's quite there's questions within that micro learning right that's what you see so, the, uh, the score as a as a function of the of how they did currently in this app we don't have that functionality where they could save their score but it um james if you can make a note of that i can talk to the programmers and see what we can do got it okay perfect let me show you um as we conclude here i want to be cognizant of your time um so Chris Patterson, the guy who built the gate app with me, we went into the movement lab and we started filming. We made a list of all the common functional activities that we wanted to tell stories about. How do you talk about rate of movement, joint range of motion, usage and sequencing, and muscle activity or torque? In this case, we're talking about um, uh, joint reaction forces. This is one of our, our, our subjects doing a squat. The cool thing about this is that you can now look at, actually this, these are moments. We thought that it was useful to talk, to visualize muscle activity in the, in, from the perspective of moments. So this person is doing a relatively normal squat. You can see that the knee moment is not as high as the hip moment, this is hip dominant. You can see that as the trunk is leaning forward, the lumbar moment is, in, of course, the, the muscles are firing to counter the lumbar moment. This can tell you about why someone who squats like this and has back injury, why his back is sore when he does it, because the lumbar moment is relatively high. This can also tell you about why um, a person who does this type of squat uh, stresses his hips more than he stresses his knee. So here's the comparison. Let me take you to the next slide. Here is a quad dominant squat. Here is how much stress the tissues of the knee are going through to keep the body from collapsing into the ground. Here is the knee moment and here's the hip moment. Here's the lumbar moment. The lumbar moment is going to be lower because the trunk is more erect. This tells the story of patellar tendinopathy. You cannot tell the story any other way. One day, hopefully sometime in 2022, you will have an app from PhysioU that will cover sit to stand, lunge, squat, forward bend. We have a number of them that we've already filmed and we're playing with the data right now. This is my vision for how we talk about human movement and tissue stresses and how we'll eventually train students to look at variations of movement. I'm not sure it's the right conversation to talk about movement faults necessarily. There is just lots of variations of movement that stress tissues differently. And that is what we want our students to be able to learn and understand. So I hope that that is a little glimpse of what we're up to at PhysioU. Um, let me just move us to the end here. Just know that um, in this crazy PhysioU lab where we're building and thinking, dreaming about all kinds of new stuff, that we are always eager to connect with you and to hear ideas that you have so that we can continue to enhance student learning. Um, we're taking next Friday off, December 10. We have a faculty Friday and I'll be talking about all the new acute care stuff that we're building. So for those of you who are tied to acute care or who have colleagues, please let them know that they can they can sign up for this uh, at our website. Um, and that would be here under educator. So if you go to physiou.health under educator faculty resources, you can see all these little mini webinars that I'm doing. Uh, we're doing them short and sweet because I think it allows me to dive deeper. And um, I'm, uh, that's it. I'm, I'm open to any thoughts, comments. Any thoughts or comments related to the current apps that we have? Kate? Just thanks for all you do. This is our first year using it. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, a learning curve figuring out what all you guys have and, and how we want to apply it to, you know, how we do things. But we've really appreciated the resources and your openness to share and meet with us. So thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Kate. How, how many other faculty at Texas Tech also employ visual you? 
Um, well, we're a unique system. So we've got one program, but on three campuses. So Ooh. there's multiples of us teaching each class because um, the didactic uh, um, classroom piece is done simultaneously. Um, and then the lab piece, of course, is run on each campus. So while we have one course coordinator, there's at least three people involved in each course, um, helping with the lab and everything. So as far as courses, we've got right now, foundational skills is using it in the spring for sure. Cardiopalm and our inpatient and integumentary class will use it. And then in a summer semester will be our clinical reasoning one, which kind of is capstone to the first year. So we've yeah. got four courses with a variety of faculty involved in those. That's when great. I was when I was teaching, I did ortho and the ortho track stuff. So I always had to make sure that I knew what they got in, in Therax and the Kines class. So I knew what they got. So then I can kind of dovetail off that. And I knew that I did the extremity exam, but then the spine guys would come and teach with me too. So they knew what they were getting. So we all knew what the left hand and the right hand was doing. So it's so yeah. cool. And if you could do that here, um, David, you asked, how do you get other faculty access? Just email uh Mike at physio.com and just get well, actually, James, how do you do that now, Mike? The, the easier way to, to do it is um, if you go, actually, let me let me share screen just for a second. It's a great question. Um, Rebecca, you're funny. Your comment. <laughs> you want to go back to PT school. I know. I mean, all <laughs> of us do now that these tools exist. So under at physio.health, if you go under educator, immediately you can get free educator access as long once they fill in this little form what school what's your name what class do you teach how many students do you teach they will automatically get an email that welcomes them into the physio family and they will have they will have what we give is three year recurring access so after three years if you're still teaching you just shoot us an email and we'll and we'll continue to give you full access um, so that's the easiest way um, to come in here. I would also add in one thing, if you want to learn more under the faculty resources, there is always these little webinars. So um, right here, free educator access, let's see, Physio U for PTA. And uh, the, the team has recently changed this, that's good. So there, we're actually working on a lot of different little mini tutorials for each of the apps that faculty could just go in and click on any one of the apps and kind of discover more. But for now, I think the easiest way to um, get access is just to have them fill up this form. Mike, how do um, the, the mini learning that have the, the test questions and the score thing, uh, are those identified specifically or how do they, yeah, I, mean, I invite them to go look at a couple of them to, to see how the score thing works. But uh, yeah, so. If you go to the apps, what we've done recently to reorganize the apps is to put all e-learning here. So if you are an instructor who's teaching physical agents and you want your students to play through a bunch of mini sims, mini sims are patient-based scenarios where they apply these different modalities, they can go in here and play these different games. And once they play the game, remember that all the scoring is here. I just ask the students, download your learning report, throw it into your into our um, kind of folder for in our LMS, they will get points for, for doing this. And they can do it as many times as they like. If they wanna get 100%, great. Um, we use this as a way, commonly the way we use this is at the end of the week that they have learned about ionophoresis, we ask them to play the ionophoresis game so that they can now apply that knowledge and then demonstrate that the application has occurred by filling out the, the or, or downloading the learning report. So a lot of these mini games, just so you know, we've got uh, wound care coming down the pipe, almost done. We've got, um, we're working on some really cool musculoskeletal imaging kind of application and clinical reasoning type of mini games um, that are coming. There's a lot of really cool new ways that I'm thinking about to help students engage with all of their, all of the things that they're testing to try to create. Some of this is creating clinical scenarios with real patients. Some of it is uh, just knowledge checks, straight up low level Bloom's taxonomy knowledge checks. Uh, all of it, the students are loving it because I think there is something validating about, about being tested on what you know, instead of trying to grasp all the things that are constantly coming out of the professor's, you know, um, 
in the learning, in, in the teaching and learning. So I think this is, this is a big thing that we've been working on this year is to create all kinds of e-learning that faculty can utilize, uh, whether it's as a quiz, as an interactive uh, experience for learning. Um, I, we're building this selfishly for ourselves as professors, but I think the students are really, really enjoying it. Other thoughts, comments? James and I are free. We're not in a rush. So if any of you want to just ask questions, have any thoughts, welcome to unmute yourself. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us and look forward, hope you have a great Thanksgiving and look forward to seeing you again in one of these uh, short Friday webinars. Thanks, George. Great to see you.